Acts chapter 6. I'm not going to make any preliminary remarks today because, as has already been stated, the Holy Ghost is simply preaching one message. In case you were not aware of it, Brother Morgan didn't get here yesterday morning till after Brother Shatwell was through. The statements he made yesterday that sounded like he was repeating Brother Shatwell, he had no knowledge Brother Shatwell made them. Acts chapter 6, verse 4. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and the ministry of the word. This is prayer's finest hour, part two. You may be seated. If I could go please to Philippians chapter four, verse six. Philippians is an amazing, amazing epistle. I read a new yesterday from the International Bible Encyclopedia. It is thought that the book of to the Philippians was the last of the general church epistles. That it was written while Paul was a prisoner in Rome. In a prison. Uh, you know, I, I realize, I believe sometimes the setting, even though the scripture is not as specific with it, is extremely important simply because the statements made in Philippians was made by someone in jail. I, I, in reading uh, the uh, International Bible Encyclopedia, it pointed out something, and, and stay there if you would, please. I'm just going to read a couple of things. In earlier in Philippians, uh, first of all, he says in Philippians 1 verse uh, 6, being confident this is the very thing that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it unto the day of Jesus Christ was spoken by a man in prison, was written by a man in prison. Verse 13, the King James says, so that my bonds in Christ are manifest in all in all the palace and in all other places. Uh, International Bible Encyclopedia says it, and then I looked up in some other places confirmed it. The word palace there is actually praetorian, or Paul was saying, here while I'm in jail in this prison, God has used me to reach the praetorian guard. All of the guard have become believers. A prisoner converted all of them. And then in Philippians 2.13 he says, For it is God that which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Therefore I can take credit for nothing. Because anything I will to do that is truly of God did not originate with me. Plus the ability to do anything that I do that's truly of God and not simply religiously motivated... The source of that ability comes from God because the word there, it is God that worketh in you both to will and to, to do. That Greek word there is actually the verb form of the noun dunamis or power. Which is, it is God that energizes or activates in you the, the supernatural ability to do what you cannot do naturally. Which is nothing. Spiritual. This was written by a prisoner. It was written by a prisoner. And what's the purpose? Is he wills, he causes us to desire and then gives us this supernatural ability to do that 
which is necessary to see the desire come to pass. And the goal is his pleasure, not our pleasure. And then, of course, in, in chapter 3, he's, a prisoner wrote, Everything that was gained to me, I counted loss for Christ. That I win Christ. That I know him in the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, which was preached yesterday, of course. Why? Because I've got a higher purpose. I'm not looking to the past. I'm looking to the future. I'm giving everything I've got to go to that future. In God. And then the verse I've got on the screen says, Be careful for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. Be, be full of anxiety over nothing. It is absolutely the will of God that at no time what's outside of me affects what's inside of me. Jesus said in the world you shall have tribulation. The Greek word there is thalipsis, which is pressure or situations that causes pressure. But that pressure is external to me. I am, I am to never internalize the circumstances. Never internalize the circumstances. Oh, that's pie in the sky, brother, right? It is not pie in the sky. It is the expected normal lifestyle of a child of God. Not the superhero, not the super spiritual, but for every child of God, the Lord expects that no circumstance ever be internalized. Why? Because while I am internalizing my circumstances, I'm missing God's purpose. And that's the test. If you have any desire to reach the place to walk with God in what I'm calling prayer's finest hour, that ultimate place of relationship with God in prayer, you, the first thing that, one of the first things that has to happen is you have to give all your care away continually. You cannot carry your cares. The word care, if I remember correctly, it's been a little while since I looked at it, it's in my notes on the computer someplace, but uh, if it, 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 that, that word in reference to uh, Luke chapter 10, let's go there a minute. Luke chapter 10, let's start with verse 46. I think that's it, or close to it, please. Uh, that's t Luke 10, 46, please. Okay, uh, Luke uh, 10.34. Sorry. Uh, go down a couple of more here. I'm sorry. I didn't plan on using this, but it's here. No. It's at the end. Just go to the last verse of chapter uh, 10. Okay, let's go up two verses. That's where I'm headed. Martha and Mary. It came to pass as he was, no, no up, up two verses, I'm sorry. Two, uh, yeah, there you go. Uh, Martha was cumbered about much serving and came to him and said, Lord, dost thou not care that my sister hath left me to serve alone? Bitter therefore that she help me. 41, please. And Jesus answered and said unto her, Martha, Martha, thou art careful, full of care, and troubled about many things. If you are a worrying, full of anxiety Christian, you are Christian in religion only. You cannot 
possibly have a true relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ and be a warrior, a fearful person. It, it, those two concepts are mutually exclusive. You may be a Pentecostalist. You may give very strong effort to live by the Pentecostal religion, but you do not know Jesus Christ. I, did, I, t- I toned that down just a little bit. I wasn't trying to be funny. I toned that down a little bit. I really did. I tried to tone it down far enough that you might be able to receive it rather than how strongly the Scripture states it. There are very few indicators in our personal walk with God that are any more revealing of whether or not we are a Christian than simply how we deal with our troubles. Whether we carry our cares or cast our cares. I cannot carry his burdens while I carry my burdens. He will not put on me anything greater than I can bear. If I determine to carry my burdens, He will not lay on me His burdens. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy, my burden is light. I have to give up my cares before he'll let me feel his burden. You cannot reach the ultimate place and relationship with God in prayer while you are a person that is totally and solely focused on getting God to fix things your way. Cannot happen. In case you hadn't figured it out already, this Brother Shatwell again has absolutely done a wonderful job of finding the vein of the Spirit here today. You need to hear what he said. You need to receive what he said. I was raised in the Navy. I lived all over this country. Attended United Pentecostal churches all over this country from the time I was born. When you're a military family and you're not going to be any place more than, more than two or three years, nobody takes ownership of you. So I'm say for I live, I'm 18 years old. I've been in the United Pentecostal Church all my life and have no pastor. No pastor. I've since learned that's a blessing. Because when God began to try to show me things in the book that I didn't have to worry about offending my pastor when he showed me stuff that was truth, not tradition. I know a lot of good men who can't follow God because it means that they will be taking a position different than they were indoctrinated to take. Because we're, once you get the Holy Ghost, you're supposed to turn off your brain and not think anymore. And when I'm talking about thinking, I'm not talking about listening to the world or the religious world. I've said this statement before. This one's going to shock you. Okay, this I'm not going to I'm not going to tone this one down. I would rather watch the Playboy Channel than TBN. I've got a better chance of being saved watching the Playboy Channel than TBN. 
I don't apologize for that. I'll say that for the general board. I don't have any problem saying that. I mean that with every fiber of my being. Because if I'm watching the Playboy channel, I'm dealing with, with my flesh and I know there's problems. It's easy for God to show me I've just done something wrong. But if I'm watching TBN and I look at all that glitz and glamour and falsehood and I get, and I get lured in by that, I can go to hell watching TBN. They got nothing I want. I'm not interested in learning how they do anything. Not because I'm an old fogey either. Because I'm not going where they're going. I don't want what they want. I don't believe in what they believe. Mm. Back to Philippians 4, please. Verse 6. Be careful for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. Next verse. And the, and the what? The peace of God will do what? The peace of God that does what? I've never thought of this in my life, but he was preaching a while ago and I sat over there. I just put it in my notes. The divine question. Do you know what the divine question is? You, you were talking about it. The, there is a divine question that I, have, I don't have a right to ask and he will always ask it. When something is going on, it is a divine question. It's a question that is the prerogative of deity only. This question, any, if I'm asking it, automatically proves I'm not where I need to be with God. But when, regardless of what I'm doing, it is God's question and it's His only question He really cares about. Everything else is secondary to this question. And He says, I have a right to ask it and you don't. Anybody want to know what the divine question is? And the peace of God which passeth, the Greek word there passeth is surpasses or is superior to all understanding. The divine question is why? That is, that question and that question alone is the prerogative of deity. It is never the prerogative of a spiritual child of God. A spiritual child of God understands why is irrelevant. My father is in control. My father is the one I trust. My father is the one who is in, it, it has all of this. The only thing I have to do is be at peace with my father, his plans, his purpose, his love for me. Why does it help anything? With the struggles or problems or difficulties you've got right now, if God tell you all of the reason why, is it going to take any of the sting out of the pain? Is it going to put any, any dollars in the bank toward paying the bill? No, 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 no. It Does it make it any easier when you stand by a graveside and, 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 and when God says this is why? No, it doesn't. But here's why God asks this question first and more, foremost. Why? Why are you here? You can't ignore answering God's question and make any progress in God. He will stop everything dead in its tracks in your life till you answer the question why to his satisfaction. Why? Why are you here? Why do you pray? Why are you in the ministry? Why are you a Christian? Why do you want your church to grow? Why? God has control over the how. 
God has control over the when. God has control over the where. God has control over the who. But in your life, God does not have control over the why. And it's the answer he wants most in your heart and life every day. Why? God wants to know why. What do you want from me? What do you do? Why do you do what you do? Why do you not do what you don't do? Why? Why do you pray? Why don't you pray? Why do you study? Why don't you study? Why do you witness? Why don't you witness? Why do you pray for power? Why do you not care if you have power? Why do you want a blessing? Why? Why? Because my friend, the answer to that question and that question alone is probably the truest indicator of spiritual maturity and development. Right there. Why? Why? And the peace of God, please leave this scripture on the screen, thank you. I appreciate that. And the peace of God, not my peace, God's peace. The peace of God. That's what's so beautiful about this. It's not, it's not the world's peace. He doesn't give me the world's peace, which is subject to circumstances. His peace transcends, is superior to, is above and beyond anything of this world, including anything the God of this world may do. So since it's his peace, it, it, there is very few things that the, that the adversary fears more than a child of God with peace. How do you hinder a child of God with peace? How do you stop a child of God with peace? How do you stop a minister of the gospel who has peace? How do you hinder a woman of God, a preacher's wife, a home missionary pastor's wife who has peace? God is in control. The devil says, don't you want to know why? I don't need to know why. The devil says, why don't you need to know why? Because my father is bigger than you. And there's nothing you can do that he doesn't let you do. Why? Is it your purpose or his purpose? Is it your name you want glorified or his name you want glorified? Why? Is it it his name you want everybody to decide whether they love or hate or your name you want everybody to decide that they love? Why? Why? Why are you in this meeting? What, what What are you expecting out of this? What, is this a little vacation or, or, or wh- wh- why? Why? I leaned over that last night to Brother Shatwell sitting next to me while Brother Stone King was preaching. I said, you know, it's not that we don't believe him. It's just none of his testimonies have a reality to them for us. They don't really. We don't think in that realm. And the reason we see or don't see what we see or don't see I'm th- talking about things of God. You throw enough money at, at something, you can, you can draw a crowd. You give enough sweat to something, you can build a group of people. You don't build a church, but you can build a group of people. You have to decide what you want. You want to move a God or you want a name? Because I'm going to promise you this. If you have something really supernaturally happen and, and, and things going on in your life and ministry, They're not going to roll out the red carpet for you unless it's to the guillotine. I was a young man. I was so young. You know, I 
20, I started pastor at 24. My wife is 19. And, and you know, and, and we didn't know any, nothing. I didn't have a pastor. I didn't have a mentor. I had a passion. I had a burden. I had a call. We go there. This is, we go to September 70. What do they do? Bible studies really weren't the big deal back then. The only way to build a church is to have church. We finally found a building after about nine months. Started having four services a week with two of us. Thursday night, Saturday night, Sunday morning, Sunday night. You gotta, I, I, how are you going to build, build a church if the only way to have church is to invite people to church and pray them through? So you want to grow faster, you got to have more church, right? Amen. Well, then bus ministry came along. I remember going out to Brother Henson's in uh, Portage, Indiana. I think it was 72 to a, the first UPC bus conference. Well, I didn't know anything about bus ministry. While I was still in the Navy and in flight training, I, we, I went out and bought a little stripped-down Volkswagen combi van, van. It had rubber mats and the whole thing, no carpet whatsoever. Started picking up kids for church. I was a Sunday school superintendent. Picking up kids for church. So I, I sold that to my dad when I got out of the Navy and started evangelizing. And God called me in Annapolis, went and bought the van back from my dad. Thank God for, for dads, right? And so we go, we go to Annapolis with two cars, our, our, a Pontiac and a, and a, and a van. And, the, and that van was to pick up people at church. And that's the only way I knew to do it. So first couple of people prayed through, one of them was Brother Libby. We all, I found a, a friend of mine I, I'd preached for us in Venice down in Florida, and he had a friend who owned a Ford dealership, and he sold us big 12 pasture Ford vans, three of them, one each for uh, each of us. We each borrowed money, flew, uh, drove, rode the bus down to Florida, picked up our vans, drove them back, and church started. We started growing. We, and then, we didn't, then we went out to Indiana and, and came back and bought buses. And we just, we're killing ourselves. November 74, we go to a deeper life meeting in Sunbury, Pennsylvania. We're running like 250, 300. Got about 25 people. We're just trying to, the only thing we, that's all, that was the thing to do. We didn't know any other way to do it. And that's what we were doing because we were going to do whatever it was to do. And, and, and needless to say, I'm on fire. And I'd heard some people say, well, he's, all he's got is a bunch of kids and, and uh, whatever, poor people. So, you know, me, I, I just kind of got cranked up a little bit and there was an opportunity to say something. I said, you know. I've heard somebody say that all I got is a bunch of kids and poor people. I tell you what I'll do. I, I'll run my 500 or 1,000 with kids and poor people, and you keep your 25. Well, man, we had a great move of God. That was a great meeting. And I'm in the parking lot. And there's a guy in the district I didn't know very well. I got to know him better later. But I didn't know very well. And, 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 and we're getting in the car, and I'm just high as a kite. I am just cranked out of my mind. I'm so, ah. And I'm getting, I almost made it. I'm getting in the car. His car's next to mine. And before I could get in the car, he said, Brother Wright, he said, I'm going to tell you how much I appreciate you. He said, I don't care what they're saying about you. I believe you're doing this through prayer and fasting and just working hard. I had a three and a half hour drive home. And all I th could hear for three and a half hours was, I don't care what they're saying about you. I thought people would be happy because we were having some growth. I found out if you break out of the pack, that's not good. People don't like success. God was so good. You know what he immediately began to do? I tried to be offended 
God wanted to know why I was doing what I was doing. He wanted the answer. And you know some I didn't want to answer the question. And God let me know he wasn't doing another thing till I answered the question. Was I trying to please men? Was I trying to get people to approve of me? Or was I trying to do his will regardless of what anybody thought? Why are you here? Why do you want what you say you want from God? Why? The peace of God which passeth or surpasses all understanding, shall keep, guard, preserve, as the Greek there, your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Let's skip down. Uh, let's read the next verse. Finally, brother, what sort of things are true? What sort of things are honest? What sort of things are just? What sort of things are pure? What sort of things are lovely? What sort of things are of good report? If there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things, nine those things which ye have both learned and received and heard and seen in me do. And the peace of, and the God of peace shall be with you. A couple of verses earlier, we're talking about the, the peace of God. Now we're talking about the God of peace shall be with you. In other words, when everything in you wants to think the negative, I'm not preaching power of positive thinking here. I'm preaching faith and trust in God. Instead of thinking the worst about what's going on, God's got a plan in all of this. There's a purpose for all of this. I, I, I'm, not some, I'm not some leaf in a, in, in a, in, in a fast-moving river that's just floating downstream, bumping against whatever rock happens to be in the way. God has a divine purpose and plan for my life. There are no coincidences in the lives of a child of God. None. Oh, well, what about sickness and what about death? Give me a break. You really want to believe the devil has authority over that? We got a family in our church. They'd been married 10 years, hadn't been able to have a baby. They're about the same age as my eldest son. In fact, he and my son played basketball together in our church school team. And uh, a good guy. They were a good couple. I mean, you know, he's, he owns a computer company, and she's a lawyer, and is right now is an administrative law judge for the state of Maryland. Not, not all that old, but God's blessed him. But no, no could. could. Couldn't have any kids. So finally, out of desperation, they go through this in vitro fertilization process. But nobody told them that there are approximately 50% of all the children that are born through in vitro fertilization are damaged. So she's halfway, th and they pay all this kind of money, and it's an extremely painful process. They pay all this kind of money, and they go through this process. Halfway through the pregnancy, they determine this child is not going to live. And now they want her to abort the, abort the baby. It's got a, 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 called a, a diaphragmatic hernia, which means, in this case, half of the hernia inside the body wasn't there. In the, uh, uh, the Half of the diaphragm wasn't there. That's why it was called a hernia. It was missing. And the, the diaphragm is what causes a down pressure on the lungs so you can take breath in, which meant at least one of this baby's lungs wasn't going to work. And they say to her, the people that helped her get pregnant now want her to pay them to take the baby they helped. Create, see. So she came up with, she, she, she's got a sister that's involved in that, that stuff out there. Now they're going to they're gonna, they're gonna claim the word. They're going to claim the word. So she, she got all these lists of scriptures and she just started repeating these verses. And she's going to make this baby live. She goes online and finds out that University of uh, Florida Hospital has this, uh, this special unit uh, there that deals with all these kind of problems. She moves to Gainesville. At, at her husband, they're still living in Maryland, but they go down there. And her dad is a businessman or whatever in Chicago, so he had the money to help her. And they, they rented a house down there, and she went through her last couple of months of pregnancy under the care of this doctor, and, and they birthed this baby, and the baby was born, and it's a miracle it lived. It was an absolute miracle. But then it had other problems too. Sweetest little thing. 
My wife and I visited them a couple of times down there as we were able to. And, uh, and it just kept getting worse, and they were praying. I, I, I sat in the waiting room with them, and as gently as possible, trying not to undermine their faith, I, I said to the husband and wife, do you have a rhema from God that this child is going to be made whole and live? Well, well we're, we're claiming all these verses. And I appreciate that, and, and God can do anything. But my question to you is, do you have a rhema? Well, well we think we do. And I'm, th- I'm thinking to myself, if you got one, you got one. You don't think you got one. So then I'm trying to gently help them because I had no rhema either. I'm trying to prepare them for what's coming. Now, okay, the baby's alive. God can give a rhema anytime he wants. But they had no rhema. And I'm not going to sit there and tell them, now you repeat all these verses every day and you confess all these verses out loud and God's going to give it. So you can twist God's arm and say, I don't care what your will and purpose is in my life. I'm going to take these verses and use them against you and make you do what I want done. Baby lived two months and 26 days. At the time, the, the mother was working for the chief judge of the Maryland State uh, Court of Appeals, which is our Supreme Court. He and that staff, almost everybody's at that funeral. It was one of the biggest funerals we've ever had. And this is what the Holy Ghost told me. And this is what I preached in that funeral. Who defines a full life? We say that baby's life was cut off at two months and 26 days. But the father said that was a full life. (laughs) I am not preaching fatalism. I'm preaching trust in the father. I I am not preaching... Not to have faith. I am preaching, don't have your faith. Find out his faith. God never fails to do what he says he's going to do. Ever. Ever. And if you've got a promise and it's not working, it's, that doesn't mean God's failing. Maybe I missed some part of it. I didn't understand it. I'm not making excuses. That's how much trust I've got in God. He cannot fail. God cannot fail. God cannot lie. I am not going to sit around wrestling with, with, with trying to explain to myself so I can continue to be a Christian. Because I've got to come up with some kind of explanation so that I can continue to live for God. Because if I can't explain why God let this happen or why God didn't keep his word, I'm probably going to bail out of here. Or at least turn it all off and go through the motions. I got an explanation. God is in control. He has a plan. He doesn't have to tell me that plan. My responsibility is to find and do his will every day. Period. End of discussion. That's it. End of discussion. It doesn't matter what anybody thinks about that. It doesn't matter what anybody doesn't think about that. Because I'm not here to please God. He quoted the verse. We've been quoting each other's verses the whole whole time. No flesh shall glory in his presence. The Greek word there, glory, is doxa. The root word there is opinion. Literally, opinion. So therefore, to glory in his presence means... I use God to change people's opinion of me. I involve myself in the things of God so that people will think well of me. 
Or if God tells me to do something I know people aren't going to understand or aren't going to like, I refuse God because if I do that, somebody's going to question me or not understand me and my, their opinion of me is going to be lowered. The glory's not yours. The opinion we're trying to change is people's opinion of God. I want my life and what he does through me not to have any effect on their opinion of me, but of his, their opinion of him. If you can't get to that place, he can't use you in this dimension of prayer I'm talking about. Because it's not about me. It's about him. It's not about us. It's about Him. Let's go down to uh, verse uh, Philippians 4, verse, um, I think, 11. Let's try 11. Uh, not that I speak in respect. This is a prisoner talking now. Not that I speak in respect of want. For I have, don't be too hard on yourself. This is not something you're supposed to instantly know. It's something you're supposed to learn. How do you learn it, David Shett? Well, you learn it when everything's coming down on your head and you pray and you ask God and there are no answers. And you, but you just keep hanging on until finally either you get answers or he changes it, but you trust God through the whole thing and you never charge God foolishly. That's how you learn. And if you do charge God foolishly, you do what Job did and repent in dust and ashes. Because you got to learn. I have learned what? In whatsoever state or condition or situation I am in, or in whatsoever state I am, therewith to be content. You know what the word content means? The absence of need. You want to get to this place of prayer? You got to get to the place of contentment. That you have no need. <sighs> oh God, I'm looking at the eyeballs are going. That, that's not what I've always taught and practiced. No, it's not what any of us have ever been taught and practiced. A prisoner wrote. A man in jail who had given his life to God and ministry wrote, not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. Why? Because I've got a father that I'm submitted to and I'm called to his purpose. I love him and I'm called to his purpose. And whatever... Whatever part in his plan I play, whatever unique place he has for me, I am willing for him to uniquely prepare me and position me for my part in that plan. It may be different than somebody else. My, you know, my eldest son's got four children. He never planned to have four children. I'll never forget the look on their faces with the last three when they would come and sit down with my wife and I say, Mom, Dad, we got news. Angie's expecting. And then you ask the stupid question, What happened? <laughs> and then you get this stupid answer. I don't know. <laughs> now you understand the context that those are both that's those are both of those that stupid questions, stupid answer, but you also understand the context. <laughs> and yet, and yet our youth pastor's been he and his wife's been married twelve years. No baby. They don't have a baby. They want a baby. Here, here, get ready. Why, God? 
Why have two people that are so busy and have so much going on, why do they have four between the ages of four and ten? I mean, how do you give your whole life to God when you got four kids, four to ten? You say, yes, why? Or on the other side, what, what are we doing wrong? How, why we've lived for God so long and, 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 and at 12 years we don't have a baby. Why? See there? I don't know why. Except i got a father. And he's got a plan. And whatever place he chooses for me in that plan... It's not my business. I've got a choice to make. I can either say no or yes. I'm in your plan. I'm out of your plan. I'm in. I'm going to cooperate with you and trust you, or I'm going to run my own life. Make your choice. You don't have but two choices. It is possible scripturally to convince God to do it your way, but everybody that ever did regretted it. There's not one person in the scripture that talked God into letting them have their way that ended, didn't end up regretting it and their children and their children's children and their children's children's children regretted it. My God. Next verse, please. I know both how to be abased and the word there is gnosko in the Greek, which means to know by experience or experientially. I know both how to be abased and how to, I know how to abound. Everywhere in all things I'm instructed to both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. How? The great apostle Paul said, in, in, in fastings often and hungerings often. The same guy that said, my God shall supply all your need according to riches and glory said, there's sometimes I went without food because I chose to. There's other times I went without food because I didn't have anything to eat. The apostle Paul said, hungerings often. And we go, why God? Where's the prosperity message? From hell. And Pentecost is deeply affected by this narrow, narrow definition of what being blessed is. That it's strictly good health and finances. What if God's place for me in his purpose requires me to go without good health and or without finances for me to be prepared to fulfill that place? Am I willing and still call him a good father? You know what? You do a few things a little different have a little bit of results with it and all of a sudden you're kingdom building. And we got 18 different Sunday morning ministries and trying to start new ones all the time. And, uh, and the ones that are close to us now that I'm, I'm, I guess I'm weird. I'm just trying to follow the book the way I see it. Uh, everything that's within driving distance, they're never going to be autonomous because uh, there was one church at Ephesus with 100,000 people, so they all met in the same location. There was one church, one bishop of the church of Ephesus. His name was Timothy. And they all met in one location? I don't think so. But there was one church and one bishop of the church at Ephesus. You understand what I'm saying? So those that are in our geographical area, they're just going to stay a part of us. We're going to do that. Well, all of a sudden, you hear the whispers, is he, is he planning on starting his own organization? It's kind of hard to do that when you've got to go to the district board to get approval for every dollar work you start. So if I'm starting my own organization, they're all guilty because they gave approval for them. I haven't started any without their approval. So if you do something a little different, you have a little results. Your kingdom building. Huh. Really? Or is kingdom building 
somebody that's sitting controlling everything with their 10, 15, 25, or 30, or 50 forever because they refuse to give up control of anything to God because they're going to impose their kingdom on this thing and hope God likes it. You tell me which is kingdom building. Next verse, please. I didn't plan to spend all this time on this. What's it, what, 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 let's read that verse. Let's read the first two verses, the verses 11 and 12 before we read this one. We all know these, I know. Not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. Next verse, please. I know both how to be abased. I know how to abound. Everywhere in all things I'm instructed both to be full and to be hungry, to be a, both to abound and to suffer need. 13, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. I can. This is not a power of positive thinking verse. This is a, an empowerment verse. When I get when I allow the grace of God to get me and my motives and my causes and my plan and my will out of the way, and I trust my Father and surrender to my Father, there isn't anything He's planned for me to do that He can't do through me. Now, i got a question. What percentage of the miracles that Brother Stone King talked about last night do you think happened in a church service? He tell, his own being resurrected from the dead took place in an emergency room. It's hard to say Brother Stone King's faith was involved. He was dead. I don't mean that dis disrespectfully at all. I, the point I'm making is it's hard to say. Well, bro Brother Stone King's faith, he was dead. He said he was dead. How many of you remember the name of the man that he said that prayed in the emergency room? Really? You do. How many, how many of you actually could tell me the name of the man right now that Brother Stone King said prayed in the emergency room when he was resurrected? Uh-huh. We know who was resurrected, but it wasn't his faith that got him resurrected. He was dead. And we don't even know the name of the man that prayed. No offense. And he wasn't even an American. I mean, the least God could have done to let Brother Stone King die in America so an American could have got the credit for praying to raise him from the dead. He wasn't... And he wasn't UPC? Are you sure? Oh, my. Then I got to tell you something right now. What we saw last night was an apparition. That was a hologram. Boy, I don't know how much you paid for that, that equipment to be able to produce a hologram here last night because we know that couldn't have been a real human being. We don't know the guy, name of the guy that prayed. He wasn't an American. He was Australian. And worse than that, he wasn't UPC. My God, what's God thinking? Oh, God, help us. Why are we here? What do you, what, what are you, what are you after? What do you want? You want to have enough growth so you can hold a microphone? Hey, I, here, take a microphone. Is, is, that, is that all it's about? You just want to hold a microphone? You want to do the talking? You know? <laughs> yeah, he talked about really everybody else's stuff yesterday, and I said, yeah, he's talking, I'm talking about his stuff. It's you know, that was a powerful message yesterday morning. There's one slight problem with it. 
you haven't had a peek at the price tag. Sermons don't have a price tag. Words from God have price tags on them. You know, they got price tags. What was it? Was it Brother Cornwell that said it about David at the threshing floor of Aruna? Is that who it was? Somebody the other night? Or Brother Travis, somebody? That I will give, I will not make sacrifice to God of that which doth cost me nothing. Nothing. I got a question. How many times in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John did Jesus pray for himself? Just once. Well, actually three times on that one occasion. And if you're going to pray for yourself, he set the pattern of how you're allowed to pray for yourself and live in this dimension. Other than that, there is no, to my knowledge, there is no recorded instance of Jesus ever asking his father for anything for himself, even though he said, standing outside Lazarus' tomb, I know that you hear me always. So Jesus says, whatsoever things you desire, when you pray, believe that you receive them and you shall have them. Oh, wow, I want that new bass boat. woo I want God to kick that pastor out and give me that bigger church. Yes. I want to be district superintendent. That's what I desire. It is God that worketh in you both the will and to do of his good pleasure. And whatsoever things you desire, you will. I have one goal, to be a conduit for the plan and purpose of God. That's it. I didn't get here 35 years ago. No. I didn't get here 35 years ago. I didn't get here Today, I said, I admitted to you yesterday that I'm sharing with you something God's dealing with me, dealing with me about, challenging me to go live in a place that I have visited on a few occasions. God always does that in your life. That's why some of us wonder, well, why is it the gift seems to work for uh, every once in a while and then it won't work? Because God always gives you a taste of where he's trying to take you. So that you, you can see the joy that's coming. So you're willing to go through the travail to get there. Always. He always gives you a taste of something. So you can see the joy, experience the joy of what it would be like. Because to get from that taste to not you possessing it, but you being possessed by that new place in God, there is a travail. There is a birth. You're going to go far down before you come back up to that spot. Because on this side of the mount, on this side of the valley, on this mountaintop, I experienced this on this mountaintop, and I get a glimpse of what it'd be like living over there on that mountaintop. And, and, and the Lord says, "Woo! This is just a taste on this mountaintop. But if you want to go over there, I'll let you live over there." One slight problem: there's no helicopter in God. He's not going to let you throw a, a, a cable across there and, and, and cable across. No, no. If you want to get to that place you've tasted of over here, you're going to have to go down a ways. 
And I don't know how broad that valley's going to be before he lets you start going up the other side. And it's a steeper climb back up than it was coming down this side to get to that place that you tasted over here. And why is that? Because from the tasting to the possessing, all of this valley experience is simply wanting to know why you want to get to the other side. Because until your motive gets what it ought to be, you won't finish the trip. You will never finish the trip. Never. You'll never finish it. Romans 8, 24, please. No, 26. Likewise, we, we talked about hope yesterday. What you hope for, you can't see. Why do you hope for it if you can see it, et cetera, et cetera. So therefore, this is the dimension of prayer where you pray without having to see. You pray the prayers God tells you to pray. Those, many of them, you will never know. You'll never know the answers that you got till the other side. That's one of the reasons why speaking and praying in tongues is so very important because it really, 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 really is the backbone of this particular kind of concept because the devil tells you it's stupid, it's foolish, you're wasting your time with gibberish. But the Word of God says, Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought. But the Spirit itself... Maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered again. I, I, I don't have time to prove it, but I, I, I've studied all the different references and, and Greek word studies I could, and, and, and I believe with all of my heart that it is a, both in the context of Scripture and also the Greek language, that it, it is valid to say that it says the Spirit maketh intercession for us by enabling us to give audible voice to the groanings or the feelings that we have down inside that are inaudible. Why are they inaudible? Because I feel them in my inner man and my conscious mind, which is responsible for putting those things into words. It does not understand what I'm feeling. My spirit, which is in communication with God, he is communicating with me about things that sometimes he tells me what it is, sometimes he does not. But I feel those things. And I have to be willing to let the Spirit help my weakness. We all have the same weakness. We don't know what to pray for. I was a young man. Just started flight training. Been raised in the church. Started going to a little church out near the Naval Air Station in Pensacola. I was born in Brother Welch's church, but I went and talked to him. I said, Brother Welch, there's a home mission church out there. I'm going to be living out there, and, and I think I could, you know, he, he could use the help and, and whatever. He said, sure, Brother, I had no problem. Go out there. And so uh, I, didn't, I, well, I hadn't gone to the first church in Pensacola uh, till after I was five, so, you know, whatever. Brother Welch has always, always been kind to me, the, the elder Welch. And so I went out there. And uh, this man had a uh, eighth grade education. He was only saved five years. He was a bouncer in the bars all over Pensacola. He was only like five eight, and he was considered the meanest bouncer in the history of Pensacola. The guy was bad, and I don't mean good bad, bad bad. He was bad. Uh, he, that's why everybody, every bar wanted him as a bar because uh, nobody frightened him. He'd hurt you right now, and he got saved. He's out there building this church. Now I'm raised in the church all my life. I go out there. He starts preaching something I never heard before. He said, you need to speak in tongues every day. He's got an eighth, eighth grade education. It'd be easy for me to have dismissed that. Well, I've never heard any of the great preachers of Pentecost say that. None of my pastors have ever said that. I went back to the book, started studying it. Guess what I found in the book? Paul said, I think, my God, I speak with tongues more than y'all. Wait, wait, wait. Paul said that? And Paul is Paul. And Paul said that. I think that's a pretty reliable pattern. Now, I'm not, I have to copy this man I just met. I only heard few, preach a few times. But I think Paul's a pretty good guy to copy. So I begin doing like Paul, which means 
That rather than going, Jesus, 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 hallelujah, 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 thank you, Jesus, thank you, Jesus, with my mind a million miles away, I don't pray in English unless I've got something to say. So that I don't waste my prayer time. Because then I'm praying in tongues. And according to this uh, verse on the screen, please. According to this, uh, I, I, the Spirit's helping me. In the next verse, please. Again, he that's hurt the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit. Because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. So I don't, I don't know what I'm praying about. All I know is something's happening. Because I believe the word. This isn't a feeling. This isn't charismatic. This is Bible. I'm obeying the Bible. I'm teaching my people to obey the Bible. Well, then we know what this says. He that searches the hearts knows what is the mind and the spirit because he maketh intercession with the saints according to the will of God. He maketh intercession. How does he make intercession for the saints? Because he allows me to, he enables me to put into words that even my mind doesn't understand things I'm feeling in my spirit from him. And I don't have to know all of this. Why? Why? Let me tell you why. Because when I'm praying in English, my level of faith affects that. But when I'm praying in tongues, I can pray for the most amazing things. And my faith never gets in the way of it. Because I'm praying it, and the Holy Ghost is giving it. And, and whose faith am I using? Whose faith am I using? So then it concludes with the next verse here. Not concludes, and we know, and, and the conjunction, excuse, not concludes, and that word and means that this statement is connected to the previous verses. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to His purpose. That's what I'm talk, trying to talk about. This is the reason to pray. It's not to get stuff from God. It's not to twist his arm. It's not to talk him into doing things that's your idea. Do you, is there any of this that's our idea? Do you think this conference was your idea? No. Then why are you feeling the way to try to make it work? You just go where he's telling you to go. It wasn't your idea. It's his idea. He just knew he found somebody that in some people's minds are foolish enough to do this. Oh, we know why Jerry Wayne is bringing those missionaries in because it's the only way you can have a crowd. Uh, Come on now. Let me tell you what. Thanks for the privilege of being here because I'd rather preach to your crowd than 99% of the crowds out there. If you think that was... Just a little nice statement to make. You don't know me at all. I pay my way around the world to talk to two or three hungry people. I never look at the size of the crowd. I'm only interested in investing myself where there's hunger. I don't know how much time there is left. That's all that matters. So here we're going. Let me, I got just a couple of minutes. I got to get out of the way here. Uh, verse 28. We know that all things work together for them that, to the, for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. 29. Now, 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 for. The word for there in the Greek means for this cause, for this purpose, for this reason. This is the reason for whom he did foreknow. He did all he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son. You see how all this fits together? It's what he preached yesterday afternoon. I'm sitting there listening to him saying, okay, God, I hope somebody's listening. You haven't heard, you're not going to hear six lessons today. You're hearing one message. Two days, one message. Predestinate, conform to the image of his son. That he, why? That he might be the among many brethren. You know what that means? Now don't, don't, you know, uh, crucify him if you want to. I may need the help. 
He is the pattern. What he did, how he did it, why he did it, is what I'm supposed to do, how I'm supposed to do it, and why I'm supposed to do it. That is God's purpose. I, all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose for, for this cause, because I've been foreknown, I'm predestinated for this purpose, to be conformed to the image of his son. Why? That I might be like the firstborn. Next verse. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called. Whom he called, them he also justified. Whom he justified, them he also glorified. And there's only one way to be glorified. And that is for you to be dead and your life hid with Christ and God. So that the glory of God can rest upon you. And people will not see you but see God. Glorified is not people talking about that great message you preached in such and such a meeting. Glorified is, oh God, have mercy. All right, I, I'm, I'm going to hurry. I'll be done here in just a minute. First, Second Corinthians chapter twelve, real quickly. You know what this says, but here's where I'm quitting. I'm putting. Look, I'm putting this away. Verse, uh, what? That, okay, let's go down. Oh, you know about the you, you know you know about the buffeting. No, 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 no. Oh God, forgive me. I'm, I'm okay. <laughs> it is expedient for me, doubtless, to glory. I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. Let's do it quick, please. I, I knew a man in Christ above fourteen years ago. Whether in the body, I cannot tell. Whether out of the body, I cannot tell. God knoweth. Such one is caught up in the third heaven. And I knew such a man. Whether in the body, or out of the body, I cannot tell. God knoweth. How that he was caught up into paradise and heard unspeakable words, which is, it is not lawful for a man to utter. Of such a one will I glory yet of myself. I will not glory but in mine infirmities. I will glory in mine infirmities. That's what I'm going to brag about. <sighs> of such a one will I glory yet of myself. I will not glory but in my infirmities. Next verse 6. For though I would desire to glory, I shall not be a fool, for I will say the truth. For now, but now I forbear, lest any man should think of me above that which he seeth me to be, or that he heareth of me, verse 7, and lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of revelation. There was given me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan. Look up the Greek word messenger, it's almost always translated angel. God sent a spirit of Satan. The word buffet there means to beat me up with the fists. Oh, Lord. Oh, Lord. Oh, Lord. We don't believe in that, do we? Oh, let's, let's rebuke the devil. Then you're rebuking the plan of God in your life. Why? Because he gave me all these revelations and he's trying to keep me saved. He's trying to keep me with the right answer to why. Not my will but thine be done. Lest I should be exalted above measure. Verse 8. For this thing I have besought the Lord thrice that it might depart from me. 9. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee. For my strength is made perfect in weakness most glad. And therefore will I, will, I, will I rather glory in my infirmities. I'm going to glory in my infirmities. Not my successes. Not my victories. I'm going to glory in the fact that God trusted me with this and with that and this difficulty and that problem. He trusted me. He can give a revelation to a donkey. He can't trust donkeys with infirmities. It takes a child of God to be entrusted with infirmities. He can speak through a donkey. He can speak through a bush that's on fire. But it takes a man that's yielded to God and sees the purpose of God and refuses to ask the question why and tells God why. Here I am. I'm your way. I'm your will. And what's the reason? When I get to this place that what I'm boasting about to myself, you, God trusted me. He trusted me with a building that fell down. Some guys get together, they want to they, they they pull, pull out the latest miracles happen to them. You know what scripture says? Hey, 
God led you in a situation where there's no way out. <laughs> Isn't that awesome? Hey, there's no way. You know how awesome that is? When it happens, David Shatwell isn't going to get up and be able to tell a bear tale about what he did. Oh God, it's it's going to be God. God and only God. Why? What you brag about reveals what your motive is. What you're boasting about reveals what your motive is. Most gladly, we're therefore, most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Verse 10. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses. distresses for what? For what? We want to know why he's doing it to us. Why? Why me? Why is this being done for my sake? It's not being done for your sake. It's not about your sake. You've been bought with a price. You are not your own. You are purchased into his plan, into his kingdom. You are his to use however he chooses. The only choice you have is whether to be thankful or resent the Father. Let's raise our hands, please.